throw a party in the presence of my enemies. Hey. You invite me to the table and you tell me just to sit and feast. You're not afraid when the terror's screaming loud at me. Cause you've overcome. You're the God of victory. Come on. I'm dancing on the grave that once held me bound. Dancing on the chains that are laying on the ground. I'm dancing out in the dark, lighting up the night. And joy becomes a weapon. And I am here to fight, fight. I am here to fight. Set me free, sing. The enemy may be all around, but I'm running free. You set me free. The enemy may be all around me, but I'm running free. Cause you set me free. The enemy may be all around me, but I'm running free. Cause you set me free. The enemy may be all around me, but I'm running free. Cause you set me free. stretch out our hands round to the heavens for the Lord is here you are here God you are here I can't go back to the beginning can't control what tomorrow will bring sing it out but I know Cause 
I'm not enough, sing it out.
And all I did was worship Ooh. And all I did was bow down That's all you ask And all I did was stay still Come on, sing that again All I did was praise Then you came in and saved me all I did was worship And all I did was bow down oh, All I did was stay still And I will not be silent Psalms 9 says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. Father, we thank you today that we can worship and praise you in this place. Come on, just tell the Lord in your own words just for a minute, just what you're thankful for, what you're grateful for this morning. Lord, we choose to praise amidst what's happening in our nation, in our world, in our lives. Father, we submit to you this morning. We say, come and have your way, inhabit our praises. And may we look to you. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, everything else fades away. So Father, we look to you this morning. We say, thank you. Have all of our praise, have our life, have our hearts. 
We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Can we just lift up a shout of praise this morning? They say there's nothing new under the sun. Everything's already been done. So why try? Because your story has never been told, and it requires you to be bold before you build. It's time for your groundbreaking at a place that embraces big dreams, that pushes you to your best, and launches you into your destiny. Bold Vision, Oral Roberts University. Hi, my name is Amick Byram. I graduated in 1977. I have a degree in business, but I've spent my entire career in the entertainment business. When I was in junior high school, they bust all of us junior high students to the high school to see the high school musical. And when I saw the high school musical on stage, I realized that is what I have to do. Well, when I left ORU, I immediately got into show business and I've been involved in lots of different types of things. I was, I've done a lot of television, some films, and a lot of theater and some recording. If anybody is a Trekkie, I was, I played the, the role of Ian Troy in Star Trek. I sang the role of uh, Moses in the movie The Prince of Egypt. I've been on Broadway. I did Phantom of the Opera. I did Les Miserables. So I've, I've had my, my fingers in a lot of different uh, types of media, and that's what I've done since I left ORU. And now I'm more producing and directing of projects. ORU prepared me in a, in a very tremendous way in that I got a degree in business. But even besides the, the, the business degree, the whole person education was even probably more important than that because it gave me a well-rounded view of who I am, how I relate to the world around me, and how I relate to my personal relationship with God and others. The priorities here are how is my career and how is my life going to impact others for the glory of God. I think the value of investing financially into this department and into Oral Roberts University is a great, great value in this regard. Giving here to the Oral Roberts University Media Department you get the added benefit of that you're pouring into students who, because they are here, they are already number one passionate about their relationship with Christ. And I can't think of any better way to give your money than for those two things, helping a student with their education, but also helping a student really grow in ways that are gonna help their career, but also in ways that are going to make them have a better and bigger impact for Christ. I don't know about you, but I believe that God's going to use each of you in this room. God's going to do something special with each of you in this room to manifest his kingdom. You may be seated this morning. I am excited. As a spirit empowered living yesterday, and I just, I'll be honest with you, I am excited about what God's going to do on this campus. There's something stirring. There's something brewing. I'm seeing it as I'm walking through the campus. I'm seeing it as I'm going through the GC. I see it as I'm walking it through the aerobic center. God is up to something on this campus. And guess what? It starts with you fixing your eyes and focusing your eyes on God and allowing him to use you today. So I pray for each of you, each of you, that you will experience and feel God's presence as we continue through today's service. I am very honored to welcome to the stage Pastor David Winston. David Winston is the pastor of Go Hard for Christ Youth Ministry in Lit at Living Word Christian Center and the director of Bill Winston Ministries, a worldwide outreach ministry. Both ministries are based in Forest Park, Illinois. In these roles, Pastor David has dedicated himself to planting and advancing the kingdom of God in the hearts of people around the world. During his senior year of college, after applying to medical school to become a cardiologist, Pastor David Winston heard the voice of God calling him to ministry, and I quote, you had planned to heal hearts in the natural, but I have called you to heal hearts in the spirit. At the age of 22, Pastor David accepted his call and began pursuing his Master of Divinity degree here at Oral Roberts University. While at ORU, Pastor David met his lovely wife, Nikki. Together, they now have four children, Jacob, Jordan, Joshua, and Lily. Would you all give an ORU welcome 
and stand on your feet for Pastor David Winston. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody make some noise for Jesus. Oh, come on, we can do better than that. Let's make some noise for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He's still a savior, he's still a deliverer, he's still a redeemer. It's not about me, it's about him. Oh man, I am so, so glad to be here. Oh, you can be seated, thank you so much. My God, it is such a full circle moment for me, and I'll tell you more about that. But first of all, I just have to give honor where honors do. It wouldn't be right for me to get up here and not. I wanna thank Dr. Wilson in his absence for allowing me to come. Yeah, you can put your hands together for Dr. Wilson. And thank you so much, Eric. I appreciate you and, and all that you do, all the faculty, all the staff. Um, you know, this is, this is a great place. This is where I learn to hear God's voice. That's so critical and so important. I'm just so thankful, uh, you know, my, one of my best friends and brother, Pastor Calvin Battle, you know, he, he's, he's been an amazing support for me. Um, and my wife who's watching, Nikki, I love you. My mom, she may be watching. Happy birthday, mom. Y'all are so special. I left home on my mother's birthday to come and be with you. Oh, it's so amazing. I'm just so thrilled. Uh, I grew up in a pastoral household. I'm a PK. Where are my PKs at? Make some noise. Oh, y'all deep in here. That's, this is where all y'all came, huh? So, so they came to ORU. That's where the PKs are. We're going to have a PK meeting after this. Lunch is on you. <laughs> and so, um, so I grew up in a pastoral household. You know, been in church you know, my whole life. But I want to tell you a little bit about my story, my testimony. Um, I asked the Lord, you know, what should I speak on? And he said, tell him about the story of your testimony and where I brought you from. And, um, and I said, okay, I'm, I'll do that. And as, you know, Eric said in my bio, uh, me and my wife have four kids together, and, uh, and I love my family, and I love serving them. It's an honor to be with them. My wife is amazing. We've been married for over 13 years. And, uh, woo, yeah, praise God. We can make some noise for that. And... Uh, She's an amazing, amazing wife, and, uh, and I thank God for her. And you know, some of you all might be in a relationship, and, or you know, we have, might have some married people, or you might be watching, and you might be married, and you know that your significant other, they might do things sometimes and want you to participate in things that you might not necessarily want to participate in. I'll give you an example. My wife loves puzzles. Do I have any puzzle lovers in here? Oh, I got some of y'all. Do I have any of y'all puzzle lovers who love to do like the thousand piece torture chamber puzzles? Those things are crazy. I say, get thee behind me, thousand pieces. A thousand shall fall at my side, 10,000 at my right hand, but it shall not come nigh me. And so my wife loves to do puzzles. And so. She always likes for us to get involved, especially around Christmas time or the holiday time. You know, everybody's together. You have all the family. You know, people are out of school, out of work. So we get all together, and she says, hey, who wants to do a puzzle with me? And I'll be like, run, y'all. <laughs> and so, because I know I don't really enjoy it as much, but like a good husband, I do it because I love her. Now, don't say all too quick, because I don't do it for like three, four hours straight. I'll do it in smaller 30-minute segments. And so, you know, I'll help her out here and there, and sometimes the kids will jump in here and there. And the most frustrating part is when you have this one piece that keeps sticking out to you. Somebody already caught it in the spirit. She said, yes, I'm at a puzzle right now. And so I have this one piece, and I keep trying to make it fit, and every time I kind of come to a different section, I keep thinking, oh yeah, this is where that piece will fit. But I can't quite find the right fit for that piece. And you know, me, being the guy who wants to make it happen, I'll try to make the piece fit in. Anybody ever do that? Like, Let me just make it fit in. Nobody will know, it kind of works. But you know it doesn't work, it doesn't fit. It's a struggle. And even more so, it doesn't help complete the rest of the puzzle. It could be a, a frustrating thing trying to make those puzzle pieces fit. And it can also be a frustrating thing trying to find our fit in life. 
And when we try to force ourselves to fit somewhere where we don't fit, it's frustration. It's hard, it's difficult. And that's where I found myself. I was trying to fit somewhere that God didn't call me to fit. Today I wanna to talk to you, or today I wanna to talk to you in the 20 minutes that we have left about finding your fit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this opportunity. I thank you, Lord, that you would speak through my lips, think through my mind, that the word would come out unhindered and unchecked by any outside force, that I would speak this word with excellence, accuracy, boldness, and precision, Father, that you would help us to understand what is our fit in life. In Jesus' name, if you agree, say amen. amen. Psalms chapter 138 and verse 8 in the New Living Translation. If you got your Bibles, turn with me. If you got your smartphones, go ahead and turn with me with your smartphone. It says in Psalms 138 verse 8 in the NLT, the Lord will work out his plans for my life. Say, work it out. Turn to your neighbor, say, he's going to work it out. Turn to your other neighbor, the good looking one, say, he's going to work it out. He will work out his plans for my life. Hopefully you weren't like sitting next to your girlfriend when you turned the other way. <laughs> for your faithful love, O Lord, endures forever. I like this next part. Don't abandon me, for you made me. God, you made me like this. Now you stuck with me. You need to help me work it out. And so what is my testimony? So this is a full circle moment. Tell you a little bit about my testimony. I stepped here on the campus at Oral Roberts University in 2003. Woo, woo, woo. This was before smartphones and before social media. As a matter of fact, we had dress codes. Almost all y'all would be at a dress code right now. We had a dress code. We actually couldn't have facial hair except having a mustache. So what did I do? Naturally, I grew the mustache. Looked like a policeman or a pastor. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I stayed at EMR. Where are my EMR folks at? Make some noise. EMR, hold it down. I'm sorry, Towers. I know you're anointed too, but you know, it is what it is. World changers stay at EMR. So, uh, just kidding, just kidding. Uh, and so I went to EMR and, um, and I had a great time here at ORU. I, um, I remember, I actually, for the first semester, I didn't know where to go to get my hair cut. Didn't have a barber, so I actually let my hair just grow. And I got cornrows. Actually, I have a picture of it. Just kidding. Uh, some of y'all, the spirit of anticipation was like, hi, uh, where, where is it? Now I don't have any pictures, thank God. But what I can tell you is every chapel service, I would come through that corner door right over there, and about five rows in from the back, I would sit in that seat. And I would listen to the chapel speakers speak, give good words, and I remember one day, one Friday just like this morning, slumped down in my chair. We didn't have smartphones, I couldn't you know, distract myself on social media. I had my Bible in my hand, halfway paying attention. But I remember I was wearing a light pink shirt, khaki pants, I was looking up at the speaker, and I said this, that will never be me. <laughs> All right? I said, that'll never be me. See, I grew up in a pastoral household, and I thought that, you know, God is doing so well with his message to mankind through my father. He doesn't need another one. He doesn't need another Winston. Bill and Veronica Winston are doing a great job. Three's a crowd, though, so I don't need to be involved in this. And I think if I was honest with myself, I think really what I was doing was I was intimidated because I knew that if I stepped up to the call in full-time ministry, if I took on the mantle, I felt like I could never be as great as my father. How can I fill his shoes? And, and so I ran from the call. And like he said, I was going, you know, and, and studying. I was a bio pre-med where my bio major's at. Come on, make some noise. And then I switched to health and exercise science. Do I get a couple of health and exercise science majors in here? But God, he came and interrupted my plan and told me about his plan. And when I accepted my call in a full-time ministry, I'd like to tell you everything was great after that, but it was still a process. Say process. And so today I want to talk to you about 
five lessons that help me find my fit. That help me find my fit. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down first. The first thing that I had to learn, because I thought I wasn't a good public speaker, how can I ever get up and speak in front of people? I'm not as prolific as Pastor Calvin or Eric, you know, some of these other people that we see. You know, I'm, I'm not a Stephen Furtick. I'm not, I, I'm not anybody like that. I'm not a Paul Darity. I'm not even a Michael Todd. I'm just David Winston. How can I do that? Somebody might be looking at me saying, I'll never do that. You're in my same shoes. And let me tell you, that's what I saw was a liability to the calling that God had on my life. I thought that it was a flaw, a defect, an imperfection. But the first lesson I had to learn is don't hide your flaws. And don't let your flaws make you hide. Or what you think are flaws, right? And everybody, you know, we always have these things about us, right, that we don't like. We might see something we don't like. We might act a way that, oh, I wish I, wish I would act differently. I mean, some of us wish we had better style. I mean, some of us are kind of style averse. If style was a virus, you would be immune. <laughs> but hey, that's okay, because God made you the way he made you on purpose for a purpose. Your aversion to style will get somebody else's attention. They'll say, I like how you dress kind of eclectic all the time. None of your stuff ever matches. I like that. I dig that. Because the way you do it is how God needs you to do it, and he's counting on you to do it that way. He's created you the way he wanted you. As a matter of fact, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 in the New Living Translation. This gave me comfort and encouragement. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. Say, that's me. We are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Now, what's a masterpiece? I mean, something that's one of a kind, right? It's valuable. It's, it's hard to even put a price on it. As a matter of fact, there's one specific masterpiece that was painted, that was one of the most talked about, one of the most sung about, most um, popular masterpieces of all time. Can you put up that first picture for me? Now, what is this? Come on, my art majors, what is this? The Mona Lisa! And so let's take it in. So, somebody say, <laughs> I can't even whistle. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, she's not necessarily my taste, <laughs> but she might be somebody's taste. You know, everybody got somebody. So as we look at her, you know, I feel like, you know, she ain't all that special. I'm just saying. But you know the thing that has always captured my attention is this fact. She ain't got no eyebrows. I mean, where, where the eyebrows at? She ain't got the eyebrows. I mean, at least she could have been like, can you tattoo them on? She could have got the makeup artist to go ahead and, you know, prepare that. I mean, where the eyebrows at? Are they behind the picture? I mean, what is this? It's amazing. She just smooth all the way through. And that has always captured my attention. Now, this is a masterpiece, but check this out. Even though we laugh, even though her eyebrows are not present, it still doesn't make it any less a masterpiece. And sometimes we can be forced to think that we're missing something. We're deficient. We don't have something. It's a liability that we're not like them. But let me tell you something. Satan tries to use that to slow you down. But a liability in his eyes is only a lie about your ability. And the enemy wants you to put yourself in this box by making you think, that you don't have what it takes. I remember the first youth message I preached, 2009, September. And I was up at a podium like this, and you know, youth were there with their shorts, teenagers, of course, with their um, you know, T-shirts, the Jordans and everything, they all decked out. Everybody's having a good time. And I'm here preaching my first Go Hard for Christ Youth Ministry sermon, 
and I have a full suit and tie. Tell you no joke. Full suit and tie. I was suited and booted. And I was so nervous, I don't think I looked up at the crowd more than three times. I just sat there and read my notes and read the scriptures. And I was like, man, I, I hope somebody got something out of this. But the significant part was when we did the altar call. I got, you know, some of them saying after service, this was one of the most significant altar calls that we've had in years. And look at me, I'm here and I'm nervous. And I think that maybe I don't have what it takes to be able to, you know, preach the word of God. I'm nervous, I'm scared. But God says, all I need you to do is say yes. Don't examine your flaws. All I need you to do is say yes. I believe that what we think are flaws, it's actually just access points for God. Because in those areas that we are weaker, we are more readily able to give that area over to God. And what does he say? What does the Apostle Paul say? In my weakness, then am I strong. Because when I'm weak, now I know I have to depend on him. I don't have another alternative. God is looking for you to give him access. My weakness becomes a portal to his power. So I kept going and I kept going. And then I had to come to this second lesson, number two. I had to learn that success is determined by the source. Because, you know, I'm, I'm working things in youth ministry. We're having a little bit of success. But I'm looking at other people, and I'm saying, but, but I'm not doing as good as he is. But I'm not good, doing as good as she is. And I'm looking at, at the success that other people are having. And I remember going to a big youth conference about maybe a couple years into youth ministry, and they were doing it on such a big scale. I mean, there was about maybe 3,000 people there. And I was like, wow, like, here we are with our 30 kids, with our 40 kids. How do we get there? And I had to learn a lesson. I had to learn how to define success. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 in the New Living Translation, it says this. Hebrews 12, 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And check out this next part. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Did it say the race that God has set before them? Did it? No. It said the race that God has set before us. So where are my track folks at? Where are my track folks? Anybody run track in here? All right. So our, we got our track team. Okay, come on, track team. So you can tell me, and I know different events are different, right? But I do know that there are certain events that you are subject to disqualification if you run outside of your lane. Is this, is this true? Is this true? This is true? Okay, so even if I'm in that event, even if I finish and cross the finish line first, but I have ran outside of my lane in that event, I don't get the gold, I don't get the win, I get disqualified. Because I don't get a prize for finishing first in someone else's lane. I have to finish first in my lane. And sometimes what we try to do is we try to look at our things, our successes, and we look at other people and we compare ourselves to them and we say, well, I'm doing better than him. Well, I'm doing better than her. But that's not how God measures success. God doesn't measure success by what they're doing. He measures success compared to what he told you to do. What has God told you to do? That's what he's measuring success by. And sometimes I think even when we look at success, we're not, some of us, uh, uh, let me say it bluntly, some of us don't want success as bad as we want acknowledgement. We really want the acknowledgement that comes from success because we're battling with insignificance. So instead of just getting the A on the test, we want people to see that we got the A, to affirm our intelligence. But God says, I've already affirmed your intelligence. I've already written a document that confirms your importance, your significance. The word of God, that's where it tells us how significant we are. And so I don't want to run someone else's race. i got to run my own race. Number three, and this one is really important to me. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 38. 
1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 38 in the New Living Translation, it says this, Then Saul gave David his own armor. And you, most of you all remember the story of David and Goliath. A bronze helmet and a coat of mail. And David put it on and strapped the sword over it and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things. And what did he say? He said, I can't go in these. And he protested to Saul. He said, I'm not used to them. And David took them off again, and he picked up five smooth stones from a stream. He put them into a shepherd's bag, and then armed only with a shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistines. So Saul tried to give him his armor, but David said, no, no, this is not what I'm used to. This is not what I use. And all he had was stones and a sling. But number three, what I had to learn is all you have is all you need. I'm going to say that again for emphasis. All you have is all you need. Sometimes we can be so fixated on, but I don't have a big following. I don't know a lot of people. I'm not connected, you know, to, to the president of the school. I don't have this. I don't come from this place. I'm not even from this country. But look what happened to David. All he had was a sling. But notice, that was the right thing that was necessary to save a nation. To save a nation of people. God wants to use you to save neighborhoods and cities and nations. God hasn't left us alone to try to figure out the problems of the world. God has already impregnated you with solutions that will help with world problems. And oftentimes, we're looking externally. God, what can you do to solve this issue? But God says, all I want you to do is step in front of a mirror, because in front of the mirror, you're looking at the solution. You are a walking solution to the things that we're seeing here in this earth. And even though David, he was young, he was a shepherd boy, it seemed like he was insignificant with this sling, he did mighty things. God does mighty things with what we look to as insignificant. It was the wrong equipment that Saul wanted David to fight Goliath with. What was the biggest danger to David? It wasn't necessarily Goliath. The biggest danger to David was gonna be fighting with the wrong equipment. Because if he fought with Saul's equipment, that means that he would have had to go hand-to-hand -hand combat. And he definitely would have died. But because he had the sling, he never had to come within 40 yards of, of Goliath. I believe that David and Goliath is maybe possibly one of the most misunderstood stories in the Bible. Because shepherds, you know what their favorite weapon to use was? A sling. David wasn't using a sling and a stone for the first time. As a matter of fact, shepherds commonly use the sling to be able to fend off bigger animals, to be able to protect their sheep. This was something that David had been using for years. He got really good at it. As a matter of fact, they could hit a target 200 yards away. They could hit a bird in mid-flight. You think David was really an underdog? No. He knew exactly what he was about to do with that sling, and it saved a nation. All you have is all you need. Let's keep talking about David. Number four, and I'm almost done. Number four. Before David fought Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 16, Samuel anointed David to be the next king. What was David doing when he got anointed to be the next king? He was just taking care of sheep. He was just doing shepherd business. He was just doing the regular thing he was supposed to. What about Saul, some chapters before when Saul was anointed to be the next king, what, would he, what was he doing? He was actually looking for his father's donkeys, and then he encountered Samuel. Both of them, this is what they have in common. They weren't trying to perform to get God to anoint them, but yet God anointed them. How many of us try to perform to try to get God to anoint us for something? I had to learn that it's not me trying to perform to get God to anoint me. It's God already anointing me because I said yes to the assignment. And the anointing is the performance enhancer that empowers me to perform. 
God won't call you to it unless he's anointed you for it. That's my fourth point. God won't call you to it unless he's anointed you for it. What giant are you facing? What task are you facing? What assignment are you facing? What field are you going into? And you're saying, well, I, I, I don't know if I got what it takes. Let me tell you, if God has called you to it, he's already anointed you for it. There's a lot I could say about that. But I have to finish on my last point, number five. You know, I brought something here with me. And you can put up my last picture. My last uh, picture. What are those? Acorns. I have my acorn seed right here. And it's amazing that in my acorn seed, in these acorns, each of these acorns contains a tree. In the acorn. Now, it doesn't seem like it right now. You can't see the tree, but it's there inside of it. It's a seed, and it's in seed form right now. And each one of you all as students are in seed form. That there's a tree inside of you. I like to call the seed inside of us potential. What is potential? It's hidden ability. I like what one man says. Potential is unused success. Here's my last point. Potential is concealed greatness. There's greatness inside of you. But number five, my last point, everything great has a starting point. Everything great has a starting point. Now, if I put this seed up here on this table and I left it there, will it ever grow into a tree sitting on this table? No. It'll never grow into a tree on this table. I have to plant it. I have to bury it. And God wants to bury you into the ground, not to hurt you, not to harm you, but to plant you so greatness can come out of you. I'm here to tell you that God wants to do great things through you, just like he's used my family to do. And it's amazing that 18 years ago, I sat back in that seat and I said, I will never do that. But really, God had a different plan for my life. And my prayer here for you today is that the Holy Spirit this year will hijack your plans to shift you into alignment with him so that you can understand how to live God's will and his purpose for your life. God has an assignment for you. And I believe that it's going to change the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to come together. I thank you, Lord, that you are using your young people to change things in this earth, that they are lifting up the name of Jesus, that they are hearing your voice, and they are going where your light, where the light is dim, Father, with the light of Christ. I thank you, Father, that this year will be different and that they will do everything that you've called them to do in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Can somebody give God some praise? Amen. Let's stand to our feet, if we would. As Pastor David said, there's greatness on the inside of you. Take that to heart today. The one that's going to help unlock that greatness, help you to become all that you're supposed to be is, is, is the Lord himself, but it's going to come through you engaging and knowing who he is and knowing who he is in you. So my hope for us as I close this out in prayer is that you will seek him so that you will know who you are with him inside. Father, I pray right now that you would fill each of these students up. Fill them up with your presence so much so that you just flow out of them, that the very nature and the very essence of God, who you are, would flow out of them, and the kingdom of God would be manifested, that, Lord, they would indeed find their fit in the world and do extraordinary exploits for the kingdom of God. I pray this morning, have your way in each of them, and may they go and change the world for your glory. We ask this, we believe this, 
In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Enjoy your weekend. This has been a presentation of Oral Roberts University, a world-renowned and fully accredited Christian university with more than 100 undergraduate majors and minors, as well as graduate degrees in business, education, and theology. If you or someone you know is thinking about college, but not sure what to expect, then visit us for one of our Quest Leadership events. Join us for this action-packed, fun-filled, spirit-empowered experience at ORU. Visit classes, attend a Golden Eagle sporting event, worship in chapel, and meet new friends. Want to advance your career but can't move to Tulsa? Then ORU has what you need with convenient online undergraduate and graduate degree programs. Don't wait. You can experience ORU's unique whole person approach to learning and graduate empowered to succeed. Visit us today at ORU.edu.